everybody, and welcome to another edition of Attack Rap right here on Rogers TV. Don't adjust your dial. I'm not Zach Scribner. You know that by now. Adrian Musso is here, though, so the day is saved. I'm Mark McKelvey filling in this week on a special edition of Attack Rap as we move into the postseason uh, and I guess uh, the offseason now for the Owen Sound Attack. Their season coming to an end last week following the first round of the OHL playoffs. Lots to dissect, lots to dive into on this special episode. And uh, Adrian, we've got uh, a few special guests with us this week. Adrian, I hope you're doing well. We're not going to see each other as often as we have. That being said, we'll probably have to schedule some golf games in the near future. Absolutely. I can't wait to hit the links with you again. We hit up Cobble last year. We'll hit up a few more tracks down your way in Guelph, I'm sure. So uh, I'm excited to get the golf game going and uh, get the sticks out. But um, it's uh, it's a little bittersweet now. Uh, Zach's not on to help me with the postseason run. I'm glad you're able to step in, in his spot. No more attack hockey, but uh, we're lucky enough to have the coaching staff or two-thirds of the coaching staff, Sean Tico and Jordan Hill. How are you guys here today? Good, Adrian. How are you guys doing? Good, good. How are you guys? Good. Life's, life's good. Masters just went on. I'm sure you guys took that in, or what you could have after on it was on the Easter weekend after all. Um, with that being said, though, we'll start off like Zach usually does, and we'll run down the CHL pl- or the OHL players of the week, and uh, none other than 67's Luca Pinelli was named Coach Co OHL Player of the Week, the 2023 NHL Draft pl- prospect. Luca Pinelli of the Ottawa 67s uh, takes home the honors with recording three goals and four assists and seven points in three playoff contests and a plus six rating, helping the Ottawa. Uh, skate to 4-1 series win over the Oshawa Generals. Pinelli started the week with a pair of assists and a 5-4 overtime win over the Generals and then took up first start honors on Thursday, recording four-point night and a pair of goals and a pair of assists in a 9-0 win over the 67s as the 67s went on to win that series four games to one. The OHL goaltender of the week is Brett Brochu of the London Knights, the overage goaltender, went 2-0 this past week with an 9 goals against average and a 966 save percentage with a shutout in his two outings. Brett helped the Knights uh, sweep the Owen Sound attack four games to none in the first uh, series, taking two shutouts in those four games. So, Mark, back to you. Yeah, well, there's your uh, players of the week and the uh, first round of the playoffs now in the books are wrapped up on Monday night. The Battle of Michigan came to a close in game number seven, the Saginaw Spirit prevailing over the Flint Firebirds and over in the Eastern Conference, one series remained, the Barry Colts uh, with a goal with nine seconds remaining in game six, defeat the Hamilton Bulldogs. So we now know our matchups for the conference semifinals. And we'll talk about that in a little bit and, and ask our special guests some of their thoughts on what they expect uh, through the remainder of the postseason. But as Adrian alluded to, we're pleased to be joined by Jordan Hill and Sean Tekel. And uh, gentlemen, we're going to just kick things off here. I know it's pretty fresh. The season uh, just came to a close less than a week ago. But uh, Jordan, I'll start with you first. Um, that, that playoff matchup against the London Knights. I look back to games two and three, uh, a couple of hard fought affairs, losing in overtime. Uh, again, if the bounce maybe goes away, it's a completely different series. What'd you make overall of that matchup? Yeah, we were excited about it going in. Obviously, we you know didn't finish how we wanted to with uh, regards to the standings, but we liked our chances. Healthy lineup, liking our chances. Unfortunately, we didn't get all of that. Um, not saying that's an excuse by any means. We still had enough bodies, I think, to get the job done, but obviously we didn't. Um, but like you mentioned, uh, Mark, those bounces that we could have got, you know, you look at some of the, the officiating will go with the start. You know, if we get a check to the head in that game two, you know, we probably have a 500 power play like we should have. You know, the league eventually came around and, and stated that, you know, to, do we score on it? Do we at least take away momentum from London? You know, over time we lose Sam Sedley to another headshot. Again, pretty blatant. Um, would have been a five-minute power play in overtime. All of a sudden it's a 1-1 one, one series going back to Owen Sound. You know, things are different. So it's an unfortunate set of balances, no doubt. But uh, the better team definitely uh, won the series. I just wish we could have uh, rostered a little healthier lineup with guys going through some stuff. 
Now, that's a good point that you bring up right there. A little shorthanded throughout that first round matchup and the injuries that you mentioned happening uh, throughout those games. And Sean on the bench, when, when you see some of those hits that we mentioned and uh, just the way that things seem to be kind of going against your squad, is it tough to keep your composure? I know that's your role as a coach, but um, to watch kind of what went on in some of those games, I'm sure it was tough to see. Yeah, hundred percent. Those, those are tough to see, you know, especially uh, like Jordan alluded to, like, the Sam Sadley one and the Thomas Chafe ones, like those those are tough to see. I think those are predatory plays um by two guys. Um and those are big losses for us. You know, Sam's Sam's our best defenseman. Sam logs 30 minutes a night. He plays our power play, plays our penalty kill. He's arguably our best player every night. Um and to have a predatory hit like that on him at such a crucial time in the game um was definitely was definitely downfall. It, it is tough to keep your composure, but I think uh for us as a coaching staff, I think that's what we have to do, right? We have to try to keep our composure because if we start to lose it, the boys will feed off of it. They start to lose it. Um, you know, and at, at that point, um, it was a little bit tough for us. I think our guys wanted to police the game by themselves, um, obviously by not having the officiating that we would have liked. Um, so I guess that might have got to our guys a little bit. But I feel like our guys kind of held our composure pretty decently well, um, and they still tried to get those two points and get those wins that we needed. Adrian, I'll let you jump in here, but uh, you join me in the broadcast booth for game number four up there. And uh, I think it's safe to say that as that one started to get away from the attack, um, it wasn't a surprise. You think about games two and three, uh, getting your heart ripped out, losing both of those games in overtime. Um, for a four-game sweep, the battle was there. I think you would agree, Adrian. Yeah, it, it seemed like the unsound attack always wanted to surmount a comeback no matter what the deficit was. Even down 3-0, they came out um came out good he took it what was it a two nothing um into the in the first, second period is that first intermission there and then the the jump was there in in the second i thought the the boys played good but it was just it seemed like every time that you guys were coming back and trying to mount a comeback something would happen jordan you mentioned there in the game where you guys mount the comeback in london and then sam gets injured and then you, you guys start to mount some sort of a comeback in game four and then Colby gets injured. So it, it just seemed like one thing after another. And um, it must have been tough to just see like Colby get injured earlier in the season, season mounts his, his own personal comeback and makes it to the playoffs. And then right when things start to go good, he scores, he gets attributed with a hat trick goal and on, on that game don't late marker. And then, just early on gets a, a big blow. And and Mark and I were saying in the broadcast booth, it might have been one of the cleaner hits that they threw. Were you guys in agreement with that when you saw the hit? Or Yeah, like like Teeks mentioned earlier, they're just a little bit predatory, which I understand. It's playoffs. Like that's kind of the old school way, which I, I do respect and I do like. Um, but that's where, you know, again, like Sean said, like we got to please ourselves. And that's what's frustrating. We weren't able to. Um, you know, instead of us, you know, in a power play, we're short. Sam Sadley and Colby Barlow, they sh actually would be short. And Q and, and other players that should be kicked out of the game. So we just end up taking on the chin every which way about it, um, unfortunately, by the officiating. And, yeah, it's that's when I start to lose my pool, quite honestly. Like, I'm pretty calm most times. But when it comes to player safety, um, when it comes to protecting your teammate, you know, I, I uh, that's when I start to have trouble with uh, how the game's being called and how we are forced to okay, we got to stand up for ourselves, but in doing so, now we're shorthanded because the refs can't, can't call the game correctly. And I don't want to keep stressing on the refs here because that's not why we lost, why we lost the series, but it definitely was a frustrating point throughout, throughout of it. And that frustration that you guys had as a coaching staff, do you think that it, it came down on the boys? And, and we saw it a little bit late in or as the game progressed, as game four progressed, uh, that Landon Hookie was assessed a two-minute minor front sports and leg for chasing or, or shadowing. Do you think that 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 uh, the fact that things were starting to unravel um, on the bench led to the boys unraveling as well? Yeah, exactly. Like like we mentioned, like we're trying to police ourselves now, so we can't go talk to a guy. We can't go tell him, you know, whatever is being said. Like. That's the game within the game that the refs don't seem to understand that is crucial to keeping things at bay or keeping things where they need to be. Um, otherwise, and if they want to take that out, no problem. Then call the call the major penalties that they, like they should be called. Don't uh, you have a chance to review them? That's what happened to Colby Barlow on his hit on uh, George. You know, it was a 
big enough hit that they thought, you know what, let's get a second look at that, make sure you could easily put it down to nothing if it wasn't a, a hit that they thought deemed to be a penalty. Um, that's what they didn't do in London twice to us. And like I said, it just was very frustrating how uh, the league and the officiating was handled. Guys, I, I look at this series and, and going into it, I, I really thought um, from an Owen Sound point of view that this series could be really close. And uh, I don't think the four game sweep is completely indicative of of how these two teams matched up. Uh, split the season series, 3-3. Three, three, and, and Sean, uh, you guys were well prepped for the London Knights. And um, had you had your full squad, if maybe all the stars had a line um, and maybe some of those calls that we mentioned and maybe gone the, the way of the attack, what do you truly think this series could have been? Because I, I get the sense that probably for the entire coaching staff, you felt that um, four games probably didn't do it justice for how um, your team was prepared and how you guys could have performed. 100%. Um, you know, I was just talking to Mark before you guys came on. Like, with the way we played the series and with the way we've played London all year, like, we were ready. And I think uh, for us, like, our, our mindset was going into that series. It wasn't supposed to be a close series. Like, we were going to win the series. Um, you know, those weeks leading up, we did a ton of prep, um, you know, everything from breaking bro shoot down all the way to their special teams, to the way they play. Um, I feel like we were really, really prepared, but you know, most people don't know. And I said to Mark before too, like we had a really vicious bug to run through the team at the exact same time. And again, it's, it's not to make excuses, but like Corbin, Corbin Vaudry had to be pulled from game four because he couldn't, he could barely stand up after a period. You know, Servak Petrovsky wasn't able to practice in between games because he just stayed in his hotel room all day. Like, you know, those are things that were running through the team and then not having Gavin and, and Colby towards the end of the year with how hard those guys played in the playoffs. You could still see like a little bit of their timing wasn't wasn't fully there. Um, and I think those things kind of did hinder us a little bit. But I think, like you guys said, you know, how hard some guys battled. Like, look at the way guys like Teos Jordan stepped up um like you could go through the through the list like guys are battling guys are going through um so i can't say enough good things with the way these guys play and the way they showed up but you know a few more bounces maybe some more healthy healthy bodies definitely i think this is a different series for sure and adrian i'll let you jump in because i know we're going to want to start to just look back on the season as a whole but i have one more question and and jordan not to, to continue to sit on the topic of the officiating but uh from our vantage point we all get to watch games one right through four we see the carryover from game one to game two to game three to game four um you get new officiating crews each game and and maybe for the viewers at home and and for ourselves is there any sort of consistency there it is the officials that come in to work game three uh aware of what might have gone on in game number two because to your point um a lot of those predatory hits and i would agree with you 100 percent um they didn't just happen in one game they seemed to happen throughout the series one yeah 100 percent oh okay. sorry go ahead Ace. i'm just sorry. fired up on this officiating quite honestly so you <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just sp speak from an official's point of view. Like, I, I know I don't ref in the OHL, OHL, but I do ref in the OHA. So uh, all the way up to tier two junior A. And, and when, when we're assigned a, an assignment or a playoff game, I, I do look at the series that was, you go through who who's in the box who and who was ref in that game. And, and you might even send out a text or, or, or a phone call to, to the refs that were assigned previous games and you get to know, what the tendencies are and and if if a certain ref tells you something you're going to be looking out for a, a player or a, a certain moment or hey this guy's this guy's running people from behind or this guy's doing this or cross checks behind the play watch out for that so things do get said do get passed along if it's the message that um one one bench wants to hear if it's a something that the other bench wants to hear like it is it's a it's up in the air. I, I truly believe that the rest, it, it's going to be, may, might not be the thing that Sean and Jordan want to hear, but the refs are there for the safety of the game. And maybe, I don't know. I, cause I, I look at those plays too, Jordan and, and Sean, and I see, I see direct head contact and I just don't know how that, how that goes unseen. And Mark, I even mentioned it in game four when on that, um, there's almost the same hit that Colby Barlow got suspended for that. Uh, I forget who the Owen sound attack player was, but got hit behind. And then there was a skirmish and then led to almost uh, 25 minutes in penalties for the Owen sound attack. So if, if that just simply gets called in a, in a three, nothing, four, nothing game, then you don't have any of that going on. So I, I don't like pointing out officials. I, I that's not my style, but 
I couldn't even hold back during that game. I think they missed a few calls. I, I have to side with Jordan and, and Sean on this one. I, are, are refs perfect? No, but, and uh, it, it was just tough. It was tough to see. And um, you'll see, you'll see come the second round if those refs are still roughing. So I'll just put that well, out there. And I'll jump in like, listen, I know people make mistakes. I know it's a fast game. That's why we have tablets to confirm yeah. that what we saw yeah. or didn't see was accurate. And the refs didn't choose to do that twice against us. And then obviously game three, it was when Colby Barlow takes a, you know, a hit, just trying to hit somebody, obviously rubbing him out. He turns last minute. They chose to go to the tablets like they should. And obviously we are the ones short again on the flip side. So it's just, like I said, mistakes happen, yeah. but let's, the rules are there and, and the video's there for a reason. Let's use it. Yeah. Oh, like uh, just to jump in there quick, like I don't. We're not even looking for people to be perfect. We just want consistency, man. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Instead of calling tic tac little plays, like let's keep make sure it is player safety. Like those direct head to head contact should be once called. Like these tic tac plays that like Brady Rogers gets a high sticking call and he doesn't even touch the guy in the face just because the guy had snapped snapped his head back. Like it's just it was just so much and it was just it kept happening and the only consistency that we had was everything was against us that was the only consistency that was in the series it was, well, it well was said. Yeah. yes i would agree and and certainly i think it's safe to say a couple of those games in, in the budweiser garden some crowd reactions and some late hands going up certainly might have played a factor uh, guys i think before maybe we do shift on and, and just look at the season as a whole maybe go through some some different parts of this team and some specific players uh what is your interest level in the remainder of the OHL playoffs? Because uh, I think it could be pretty easy to quickly just uh, maybe turn it off, focus on your own squad, focus on the summer, but uh, a team that knocked you guys out is going to march on. They're going to face a Kitchener Rangers team that you guys know very, very well. I, I think it's uh, probably a fair question to ask about that series. And, and Jordan, for you, um, do you have any sort of prediction for, for how that series might go? No, I mean, I, I definitely thought Kitchener – had a very good chance against Windsor. Did I think they were going to sweep? Absolutely not. Um, but I'm not surprised one bit that they're moving on to the second round. Um, obviously, you know, being from Sarnia myself, you know, I have a long history just knowing that the Sting have never or only twice made it to the second round. I've never made it to the third round. So I have some intrigue, obviously, to how that's going to play out for the city of Sarnia. Um, and obviously you have the Saginaw beating Flint last game. Um it's going to be a good series starting in Saginaw. And obviously when you have uh, two powerhouses, London and Kitchener, it'll be fun to watch. So as much as it pains me to watch, um, it's part of my job to kind of see how players perform in, in the hard times. And uh, it's important for us to keep, keep tabs on how things go. Sean, for you. Yeah, I think for me too, it's, uh, you know, the last couple of days have just been for me at least, um, you know, a lot of self-reflection, I think, and just kind of looking back at the year and just looking back at those things. And I think uh, for me, it's kind of just turned the page. And like Jordan said, like, you know, I'm definitely going to watch those series. Definitely watch the Saginaw Sarnia series because I think that'll be interesting. Um, you know, uh, we talked about it a lot. Like, you don't want to play Kitchener in the first round. And you can see that. You can see how that played out. Um, and even in the East, you know, it'd be interesting to see what North Bay does. It'd be interesting to see what Ottawa does. You know, a lot of teams loaded up, so. I'm definitely keeping a close eye on a lot of series. Adrian, I'll kick it over to you to kick off our, our recap of the season, maybe from start to finish, because uh, um, you guys have been doing this all season long, Adrian and Zach on, on attack wrap, and you guys have tracked the, the ups and downs each and every week on, on attack wrap. So uh, why don't we kick things off as we look back? Absolutely. And, and you talk about the ups and downs. I, I think I described the, the on sound attack season this year as kind of a roller coaster. It's been a, a lot of highs, a lot of lows, and and it, it finishes sadly on a low. But now let's go back to when maybe the season was at its highest is in the preseason. You guys were ranked as an honorable mention in the CHL top 10. And do you think that those early expectations were a little too high for this group, or do you think they were merited? I think for us, um, I think for us, I'll go first. I, I think uh... – I think those expectations were merited. You know, you look at this team, I think the only thing that kind of, you know, was a little bit tough for us was understanding how young our core actually really is still. Um, you know, you think of the Seti Gandons, the Petrovskis, the Kobe Barlows, like, you know, you look at those guys, those guys kind of all pulled their weight. And I think we just needed a little bit more from our older guys 
guys kind of down the stretch and especially in the playoffs. Um, but I, I see where the expectations came from. Um, but I think, you know, leading into next year, I think the future is even brighter. I think, you know, those guys are a year older. Those guys are a year stronger, a year more of experience. And I think, um, you know, leading into this year, I know, I know as a coaching staff, we're really, really excited to go into the next year and see what we, we, we can do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with, with Sean there. It's uh, merit. They're warranted early on just from our group. But like you said, our best player is 17, you know, Kobe Barlow. Like, that's uh, – you forget sometimes his age when he's so mature, but at the same time, he's still a kid. And, and guys around him, like Sean mentioned, are 18 years old. You know, your your best players have got to be your 19, 20-year-olds, and we're, we're still a year away from that. And I'm looking forward to, obviously, uh, when that age comes, hopefully, here in August, September. I'm still not convinced that Colby Barlow is actually 17. He looks way older than me, so um, I don't know about that one. But He's more mature prior, than I am. Yeah. <laughs> prior to the season, Greg Walters, I know he's not on the show tonight, but uh, he was quoted as saying that 30 wins is no longer the standard for this team, and it was 40 wins. You guys obviously felt short of that, but kind of, I guess it's the same question again, but if you were to restart that season, that quote would still stand in your mind then? 40, 40 wins was the standard this season? Yeah, for sure. Like, I, I, you know, a lot happens in a season that kind of just gets lost in the shuffle, which is how a season should be. Um, but unfortunately for us, we took a lot of injury, man games lost. Like Sean alluded to, we had a, not a flu bug or a bug that went through, I would say, half our team and hit our a few of our top end guys hard and play off at a bad time. You know, our goal pending, obviously we had mono for Corbin Carter was down, obviously with the, the junior B St. Mary's. We couldn't really pull him up just due to contracts. Ricky had his struggles this year. Chenard, um, you know, kind of a perfect storm for how some things went negatively, negatively for us. We had two, seven or eight losing streaks. You know, that's kind of rare. Uh, we, we were definitely a streaky team and that's just something that, you learn from and you carry into next year and kind of prove wrong going into next year. Now, Jordan, for the we have you on for the first time, so welcome to Attack Rap officially. This you, oh well, yeah, I got this the first times, two, eh? I think. Eh? I, I no. apologize, kids take up a lot of time. Sorry, guys. Yeah, especially with two boys, two under two. That's that's got to be a tough one. So, yeah, um, crazy. We we appreciate you taking the time here tonight and and being on. But uh, you had two key me- talk, talk talk about twos. You had two key members of the D core leave you guys last year, and Mark Woolley and Igor Cherbukov. Not not only were they key veterans on the back end, but they're also well Igor especially giants on the back end. And Mark was voted in the coaches poll as being one of the hardest hitting and the best defenders in the OHL last season. Did you guys prior to the season? I'm sure you guys had a plan of how to um, fill those roles. But as the season wore on, did you realize how much of an impact those two players had on your team prior to this season? Yeah, like the, I knew they'd be big losses. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, Chibrikov was incredible for us down the stretch. Um, Wooly is just obviously a, a scary human on the ice that everyone respects and, and kind of is understanding that he could change the momentum of a game with a big hit or, or put a guy out like obviously Dylan Hammer, all the other, some of those big hitters in the league. Um, I did notice the one game, I think well, uh, Wolves was suspended and, and probably I didn't really understand a big, as big of impact and none of the viewers or, or fans would even understand what, what a guy like that leaves your lineup and all of a sudden there's no protection for, this is where fighting I think has to stay in the game, even though obviously leagues are trying to limit it, but it would be it's it's actually very interesting how much all of a sudden guys would run their mouths would would all of a sudden be stick slashing guys in the vulnerable places it's it was very apparent to me when we missed woolly a few games that i was like wow teams are now feeling like they can take advantage of us and obviously like we mentioned with officiating sometimes you can't expect the officials to police the game properly or call it properly when you don't have that guy to kind of keep everyone in line and police police the game that that was a big loss and it was felt obviously at times during during this season no doubt john uh 
you know, with the way you guys had to face injuries all season long, constant line juggling, um, talk a bit about how that impacts you guys as a coaching staff, but also for the players, because I'd imagine, um, I think it's safe to say everybody should be very familiar with each other by the end of the year, because I think everybody got slotted up and down that lineup or played with each other at some point, but that constant line juggling, um, was that a little bit frustrating? Would it have been nice to kind of have some set units that you could have rolled out on a real consistent basis? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, as a coach, that is really is frustrating. You know, you come to the ring some days, you don't even know who you have for practice. Right. So I think that was that was really frustrating. I think even for players, it's frustrating. Right. You look at lines you might have had last year or lines you've had times before, like, you know, they might be clicking last year. and Now they don't get off the start that you think. So you take them apart. And then I think as a coach, like sometimes we can overthink that. Right. We can kind of um, be too quick to pull them apart or jump the gun to separate them. Um, you know, those things take time. Chemistry takes time. Um, just understanding where guys are going to be, where guys are going to be on the ice where they can put pucks, um, you know, even leading on to like, I don't think we've had a full power play unit until the playoffs there. Right. You know, there was always pieces going in and out. It's the same thing with penalty kills, pieces going in and out. I think those little things are just so important to teams and, and just going back to again, health as a team, that that's kind of what the toll takes on. We'll, we'll dive in on the other side of the break. We're going to take a break in a few minutes on, uh, going through maybe the rookies, some of the veterans that are graduating, L lots to cover. There's no doubt about it, but I want to get your guys' opinion maybe on a, a highlight this season. Uh, we can leave going into the break on a positive note. We'll start with, first with you, Jordan. Was there any point in the season that uh, maybe you look back as maybe a real uh, highlight for yourself? Uh, that's always a tough question for me. There's just so many little things. Like, we have so much fun at the rink. I will say that. Our group's amazing. Like, they come to the rink with smiles on their faces. There's obviously our coaching staff. We have a <laughs> – Wally's a fun man to be around if any of you guys get a chance. Like, we laugh constantly. The players come in, and it's like a lounge sometimes. So, there's so many little stories that I can't even – probably pick one off the top of my head I, I do enjoy this player development side of things you know I'm, I was happy a lot of our guys had career years you know that's the biggest thing I, I you know the reason I got into coaching is I want to see guys get better I want to help guys get better and I thought a lot of guys did that this year even though as a team we obviously didn't get the job done which we were hoping but our team got better or our individuals got better and it's just going to make us better uh, heading into next year Sean we got a minute till break uh, what about for yourself I think, uh, you know, there's a few. I think, uh, you know, Kobe almost reaching 50 goals in his draft, I think is a pretty cool thing. Um, you know, seeing Sam sadly almost get 50 assists, it's pretty cool. But I, I think that, like, kind of what Jordan said, I, I want to touch on guys like Taos Jordan, you know, watching those guys develop and seeing the job that Jordan Hill's done with him. Like, he went from a 12-round pick to playing 35 minutes a night during the playoffs. Um, you know, those are just such good things and such good feelings, I think, as a coach, and that's what you – really get into coaching for yeah and you know what guys I, I think if I could pinpoint maybe one weekend in in the season that really going to stand out to me the hockey day in Canada weekend uh, obviously the tough loss in London on the Friday night we can just erase that but the victories over Peterborough and then over the league leading Ottawa 67s on the Sunday afternoon I thought those were just tremendous tremendous victories those really stick out and uh, nice to find the positives and what might have been a season that ended disappointing and we got a lot to talk about on the other side of the break we're going to continue to look back on this most recent campaign for the Owen Sound Attack and look ahead to the future with us this program is brought to you by Ignite TV now you're in command visit rogers.com for more details the Hit UK show returns to Canada with a brand new season welcome to the New costumes. Two wheels on the back. Two wheels. New performances. Your singing is off the charts, breathtaking. Same old question. Who is behind the mask? Shania Twain. That's so sweet. Kylie Minogue. The Masked Singer UK. New episode Sunday at 7.30 on Game TV. Hi, I'm Krista McKee of Wandering Grey Bruce. This season, we will be meeting some really interesting people. Uh, we're going to go visit Thornberry in the Clarksburg area. Just to name a few, we will be going glamping, learning about some garlic, and checking out some live edge furniture. And you can see all the little wormholes in here. And it's smooth. Watch us on Rogers TV or online. 
Hi, I'm David Shearman, host of Politically Speaking. Join me for my next show, where my guest will be Ross Kentner, the mayor of Meaford. Politically Speaking on Rogers TV. All right, everybody, and welcome back to the special edition of Attack Wrap. We're pleased to be joined by special guests Jordan Hill and Sean Tickle. Mark McKelvey filling in for Zach Scribner. Pleased to be sitting co-host with Adrian Musso. And Adrian, coming out of the break, I want to hand things over to you as we continue to look back on this 2022-2023 season for the Owen Sound Attack. Yeah, now we're going to d- dive into the players a little bit, and we're going to start off by talking about the four rookies, 16-year-old rookies. We'll start off with the former first-round uh, pick in Ben Cormier. Ben had a had a, a year where he developed very much, and it was very prominent development later on in the year. Um, do you think the standard was – when he came to the team, do you think the standard was just a little too high? Not from you guys, but maybe from himself after seeing what Colby Barlow and Cedric Gane don't just did the year prior. Do you think he was like, oh, this league's going to be easy and that's what I can do? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, coming in, I think uh, he had a little bit of high expectations there. And, you know, I think he quickly found out how tough the OHL actually really is. Um, but, you know, just to touch on the positives with Ben, I think Ben, ben made huge strides, you know, down the stretch here. Um, you know, in the playoffs, like he played his best game. In the, he played his best hockey in the playoffs, which is which is attributed to him and the development he's done. Ben's a strong kid. Um, you know, he's got to use his shot a little more and figuring out when to find those soft spots and get the pucks off and, and using his speed and strength. But, um, you know, we're pretty pumped to for the future for Ben. You know, like I said, watching him play his best hockey down the stretch and when it's the toughest point of the year was a real positive, I think, for us as a coaching staff. Um, but you are right. He did go through a lot of ups and downs, and it, it took him time. Um, and I think, you know, the big thing is when you get a lot of these guys, some of them have never been coached before. You know, and I think just getting – when you get in with a guy with Greg Walters, you know, Hilsey, like, they're they're so detailed, right? And you can kind of just see as guys start to talk, it looks like their head's going to pop off. You know, so it just – some of them, it just takes a little bit more time. Um, and I think we're really excited with what the future has for Ben. Now, Jordan, I only asked the previous question because last year in Game 6, when Ben attended the game and uh, – of the Game 6 of the playoffs, he was there. I was interviewing them, and he's like – his resp- uh, one of his questions, I was like, what should we expect from Ben Cummings? He's like, I'm here to score goals. So, uh, obviously, that uh, that didn't come this season, but it could come in, in future years. But it just shows – it showed me then that this kid is full of confidence and, and – and, is that what you guys see on a day-to-day basis that he comes in with to the rink with the with the abundance of confidence? Yeah, I think Sean that kind of alluded to it. Like, yes, for sure. Um, everyone kind of expects big things their first year. Like, it's, you know, almost a young kid. How do you not after watching what Colby and Seti did the year prior? So I don't even blame him. Um, he came in definitely confident. Um, but then he learned very fast that, like Sean said, like your head's going to explode because we're very detailed. We're our coaching staff and, and how Wally likes to run things is is very detailed. That's how you have to get, play the game at this level and the next. Um, so there's definitely times of realization of, you know, holy smokes, this is a good league. And he, like like Sean said again, he he finished the year very solid. And a lot of these kids, we we do forget that that you know, 16 year. You're used to, you know, going to school, your normal times, and then going home, hanging out with your friends, going to having dinner with your family, maybe practice later on. That's twice a week. They go from all day at school in a new environment in a billet home to from two o'clock to get out of school, right to practice at two thirty, right to the gym. It's exhausting for these kids, young, uh, you know, early on in the season. It's and there's always adjustment periods for different players and how long each guy can adapt to the environment, but. All of our rookies, I did a great job this year, but it definitely took more time than I think um, than usual, just because of how deep we are. That doesn't mean it changes their long-term projection on how, who they're going to be as players. Yeah, and I think um, it's safe to say when people look at the lineup and you see some of those rookies are playing maybe in the bottom six, uh, it's going to take some time for them to grow. One of those players, though, that seemed to uh, pick up on that role maybe in the bottom six and, and work 
tremendously hard. I think it's safe to say as a motor is Antonio Terracini, and he certainly caught our eyes throughout the season. And uh, general manager Dale DeGray uh, at one point pointed out, pointed out that he thought uh, Antonio would become a fan favorite. And I think if he continues to play with that motor that we saw this year, uh, that is probably a safe bet. Um, Jordan, you look at his development throughout the season. Uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, here's a player that was uh, giving it his all and, and probably got rewarded with some, some increased roles throughout the year. Yeah, no question. And that's, you know, a little bit of a benefit to some injuries we talked about earlier. It's someone else needs to step up. And I can't tell you guys how, how much time Teeks has spent with those young guys learning, obviously, the systems, understanding what's required of them every day. Um, and he was one of my favorite young guys to watch. He almost reminds me of a little Aiden Dudas at times, just how he's so good down low. And, and maybe I'll let Teeks talk a little bit more about him. But he, he's an incredible kid coming from a great family and the sky's the limit for him. But we're excited to have him in the, in the uh, Owen Center attack locker room. Yeah, go ahead, Sean, because uh, you're working with these young guys. I'm sure um, you mentioned it already a bit about that uh, point of pride to see them with their development. Yeah. You know, just like what Jordan said, Tony's Tony's such a pleasurable kid to be around. You know, he comes to the rink every day, smile on his face. You know, he's one of those kids that, you can be hard on, like you can be hard on Tony and he always seems to respond. Um, Jordan touched on it too, like down low, he's probably, he might be our shiftiest player down low. You know, that guy was spinning off checks of like the top defenseman in the league. Like he was spinning off checks of guys that are 20 years old. Um, this kid plays with no fear. He goes through dirty areas. He gets banged around. He just gets back up. You know, at one point I told him he looked like Gumby to me on the ice, man. Like he was just like getting knocked out. He was all over the place, getting in front of the net, getting his nose dirty. So, you know, I, I think Dale's kind of hit the nail on the head there. I think this kid's going to be a fan favorite. Uh, when he gets stronger, he gets a little faster. Um, he works on his shot. I think this kid's going to be a real effective player in this year and uh, in this league. And I think those are guys that you win with in this league. It took him till March 8th to score his first goal. You, you mentioned it uh, just a few minutes ago. The kid's always smiling. How long did it take to wipe his smile off his face after he finally got his goal just uh, uh, a couple of games after thinking he scored, but uh, it getting just a lot. I think I, think I might have been more pumped than he was. Yeah. I was like <laughs> jumping up and down. Me and Wally were like slapping each other. It was, it was awesome, man. It was awesome to see. And, and that just – that goes to show you how, how well liked Tony is around the locker room. You know, those guys on the bench were elated. You know, I think the bench was more excited than he was. And it was just awesome to see, you know, just because those guys see how hard he works and, and the details that he's trying to get into his game and what he puts into every day and all the work he puts in. And it was just awesome and awesome feeling to see that. We'll get to a couple of the other rookies in just a second, but looking up front with those specific rookies in Cormier and Terracini, what's the expectations for them next year? Um, not really talking about numbers, but should they be coming into camp, um, obviously with the motivation that there's opportunity for them to move up the lineup? Yeah, I, I think for sure. You kind of look, you know, our, our top our top six is coming back next year. You know, I think that's that's a huge thing. And I think those guys can take that extra step to be, to be those top nine forwards and and that opportunity is there to lose. Um, you know, they're going to come back. And like I said, like, you know, even in their Isaac's interviews, like we, we couldn't be more than happy with those two. So, you know, it's up to them to put the work in the summer. It's up to them to come back into camp into shape, you know, make sure they're ready to go and make sure they get off to a rip roar and start because it's their spot to lose. Now, Jordan, the two next players that we'll be talking about play arguably some of the toughest positions to play as 16 year olds. And we'll start off with Braden Rogers. Uh, defense is a tough position to play. And then when you're 15 years old for, for most of the season, it's e even tougher. Um, he didn't end up scoring a goal this year, but you, I, I bet you, you couldn't be happier of the progress that he made this, this season, especially getting the big man that's come playoff playoff time against the London Knights. Yeah, I'm actually kind of surprised he didn't score because this kid actually has a bomb of a shot, which you wouldn't expect from the string beam that he looks like. He's got no muscle. <laughs> he's got a lot of work to do in the gym, but, you know, he's a late birthday, so he's like almost, he just turned 16. You know, it's, um, he's a young boy, young kid, young boy, like almost like a lot of firsts for this kid in, in this league. Uh, and I'm sure this year he saw a lot of, uh, like I said, a lot of firsts. Um, but yeah, tremendous kid, great family again, puts in the work, you know, wants to get better. 
definitely a lot to still absorb, but he he made massive strides. And obviously in playoff time, being put in that environment, there's nothing but positivity um, for his learning curve, obviously understanding what it feels like to be in a playoff game, how much more intense it is, how every second you're on the ice matters. You're not just, you know, floating around like every detail it, it does matter so it was a, a great first year for him and I'm, I'm really excited for his future i'm glad you mentioned his sh- i'm glad you mentioned his shot though because in in our famous what's in the hat segment uh one of the questions is always who has the best shot on the team and early on in the season the players were skipping colby barlow and they were going straight to Braden Rogers as the hardest shot on the team. And I, I'm i like, when is this kid going to unleash it? So then I watched the warm-ups. And that guy doesn't even take a stride. And it's no, on and off his stick. Over. It's unbelievable. Him and Tomislav Brennan, actually, in warm-ups, when I watched yeah. them shoot a puck, I'm like wowed by their shots. Yeah, yeah, there's another guy, Brenner. Like, what a what a future he's got. He's just got to stay healthy. And he's got a bomb, too. So, yeah, we got a lot of, a lot of triggers on this team right now. <laughs> You can never have too many shooters. I don't think there's any uh, doubt about that. But we, you need a goaltender. And uh, I think we certainly have to take a little chunk of time now to talk about Carter George and what we saw through his 10 games. Uh, remarkable 7-3, and three, sparkling numbers. But what clearly stood out to me, again, was a couple of aspects of his game. One, um, his puck handling ability, his confidence out there when pucks came towards him, putting his D in nice position to pick up the puck behind the net or at the side of the goal. But that seemed to go right through the lineup. And and I'm sure you guys uh, saw that. And I know I've, I've talked to both of you after games about it. But the confidence that your group seemed to to gain when he was between the pipes, um, it was very evident. Yeah, he's a special kid, there's no doubt. Um, when you have goalies that handle pucks like Corbin Votary and obviously Carter George, um, it's you play a lot more in their end because you can break the pucks out a lot faster. You're not spending as much time in your in your own zone, obviously, when they move pucks to our D who are ready to obviously move it to our forwards. Um, and he smothers everything. Like he if if it hits him, it, he's usually gobbling it up and like again, you're not playing D zone for very long when when Carter's on the ice, and that was a you know your team plays more confident. And let's talk about his swag. Like this kid has got swag. I was mind blown. Like who is this kid? I think it was our first game in Barry. He was he came into the game. We were down five nothing. You know, all of a sudden it's shootout. He, he's talking like, "Don't worry, boys. This this is a joke. I got this." Like <laughs> things that I was obviously not cocky like he, he definitely walks yeah. the line in a, in a good way and our team eats it up and they, we love playing in front of them so it's a uh, it's an exciting time for our goaltending hopefully uh like i said Coburn got hopefully healthy over the summertime he had a tremendous year as well i could not be more excited for our, our goaltending tandem next year and big things we're expecting from both but yes carter george is a special talent there's no doubt he's not only a special like talent man that kid that kid works his yeah. bad off man you know, he, he stays out, he stays out every day after practice and he takes hundreds of shots. Like he was out there one day for 45 minutes, probably taking shots from Barzo, from Barlow and Sam Sedley. Like, and like, he's taking, like, they're betting on, they're betting on saves, they're betting on games and like, he's beating them. Like guys are holding McDonald's, like guys are holding them stuff. It's, it's crazy, man. It's just. It's unbelievable to see a 16-year-old kid. So many people gravitated to a 16-year-old. Yeah. You know, it's just crazy to see. He's just a special person. He's a special goal in this league for sure. And what might be craziest is he was riding pine in junior B. In uh, the- yeah. <laughs> I think I think it left us all shaking our head quite a bit, but uh, very exciting to see what the goaltending tandem could be come next season. And uh, again, having good goaltending can cure a, a lot of problems if, if other areas of the game aren't going. Adrian, I know we've gone through the rookies here now, but I think we should take some time to talk about the overages that are departing. No, they're not going to be part of this team come next season, but they they usually leave a, a lasting impact. And uh, let's start first with with Nolan Seed. It would have been five years here if we not lost a season uh, due to COVID. And, and I thought Nolan could have been maybe the unsung hero this year. I don't think he got enough praise for the way that he played Jordan. You got to see his development firsthand for, for many of those years. Just what do you make of what Nolan Seed brought to the team this season? Yeah, this season was definitely Nolan's best year. Um he led so well off the ice. He, a lot of guys, like he's such a likable kid, um, you know, very popular in the room, if not, you know, one of the leaders with Colby Barlow right next to him. Um, well, he was like the dad, him and, and Ethan Burroughs were almost like the dads of the group. 
Um, and I was really happy for Cedar this year. He, he definitely had some struggles early on in his OHL career. Um, I spent a lot of time with Cedar and got close with him, obviously. Um, so I was happy he had the success that he did, at least put the put some numbers on the board this year, you know, had a prominent role, wore a letter, and was a big impact on our on our on our group on and off the ice. Now Nolan Seed was uh, as on Hockey Day in Canada it was seen when Ron McLean went into the uh, went into the room that Nolan Seed sits beside Colby Barlow. Was that done on purpose? I, I'm assuming it was done on purpose prior to the season. Yeah, it was. It's um, like Colby's still learning how to be a captain. Like you don't just you're you know he's definitely born a leader, but you don't just learn overnight. Like you you know he needed some guidance, and that's where Cedar was there if he needed to ask questions or. Cedar's been through it, you know, a few more years than Colby. That's all it come, came down to. And and they did a great job supporting him. And that's all it was about. You know, Colby has the presence already with just the how he plays, how he handles himself, how he how he, you know, he's he's driven and makes your teammates better. But Cedar was that guy that's very easy to uh to talk to, to kind of get anything out of. And I like I said, I don't think he could have done a better job this year in that realm. Next on the list, we'll go to the guy that's made uh, a lot of headlines in the last couple of days uh, with the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, Nick Chouinard. Uh, he played uh, his his OA season, parts of three seasons with the Owen Sound attack. Uh, uh, an up and down year for him. He started off pretty well, but then after his injury, uh, couldn't f- quite find the gear that he had um, last last season, especially in the playoffs. Uh, what do you take away from Nick Chouinard's uh, game this year? And uh, And, yeah. I think, uh, you know, for, for us, you know, coming into the year, I think Rick was supposed to be our horse. You know, it was a guy that we were going to ride and he was supposed to be our number one. And like you said, he started out hot. You know, I think those first eight or nine games that he played were, were real, real strong. Um, and then some stuff caught up to Rick. You know, I, I like, I think he, he needs to be a little bit more dedicated off the ice. Um, but you can see that in his up and down performance this year. Um, it was definitely something that was a little bit of a hurtful thing to happen to us. You know, like Jordan said, though, Corbin, Corbin Votary has gotten so much better. Um, you know, was Corbin ready for the full load at that time? Probably not. Um, but tribute to him, the work that he put in, um, he definitely became our horse down the stretch. Um, but definitely an up and down year for, for Nick Schneider, for sure. And it's almost... Um... I guess it's not how you would have drew it up. Like you mentioned, Sean, the fact that the expectations were that Nick Chenard would carry the load throughout this season. That being said, Corbin Votary got some very valuable experience that's going to help him going forward. And even a Carter George, if, if Nick is playing all season long at a pretty decent level, Carter George doesn't get those 10 games and maybe we don't really know what to expect next year. And, and Jordan, you've already mentioned it though. Um, I think that's one area of your team that there's really not going to be any concern going into next season is the goaltending. Yeah, zero in the next few years, quite honestly. So we're, uh, you know, you usually build your team from the back end out, and it's nice to have a goalie that can uh, steal you games if you need him to, or just even just make the save that he needs to make. Uh, that's <laughs> it's backbreaking when all of a sudden the goal goes in that shouldn't from a bad angle. You're playing sound structurally, you know. I you've been on the the bench obviously when those go in. You've been on the ice of the player when those go in. It's it's defeating, and that's where. That's what Carter did. You know, Carter came in and Corbin at times were just save this, the saves they need. We don't need you to be outstanding. Just make the saves that you need to make and uh, we'll play uh, obviously hard in front of you. So going forward, I'm, I'm pumped for the t- t- two tandems we have next year. We're going to get to the players that are returning next year in just a moment, but one, o- one overager left to talk about. That's Matthew Pappas. Uh, went up and down the lineup, chipped in wherever he was needed. Uh, his puck possession, some flashes of brilliance at times with some highlight reel goals. Uh, seemed to chip in in all areas of the game, but I have to ask, when was it decided that Matthew Pappas was going to go back to D in the playoffs? When did you guys have this in the works that if you needed to drop somebody back, it would be the overager Pappas? Well, we had 4D. We had no other choice. Um, <laughs> one didn't hurt the other couple. Um, for me, anyways, we we played against Pappas last or well last year, um, and there was a game where he played D. And I remember being like, "Boys, like let's feast on this dumb forward." <laughs> <laughs> and let, you know, will behold that he was actually pretty good. He, you know, he's very good with the puck. He broke the puck out very well. Um, very calm for a guy that's never played the position. I remember just being a little impressed when he was on Guelph. And then um, there was a situation during the year. I can't remember when it was, but 
we almost pulled them back at one point just because of like again a situation where we were bodies banged up um never happened um, but i did see him practice at the one game and so it was always in the back of my head that he was the next guy if we really needed somebody i wasn't expecting to have to go down that road i think the one game we played with four d and and one forwards which game three of the playoffs overtime so you know testament to our group for for battling through all these adversaries and adversary and and obviously injuries yeah, I think, uh, you know, having Pat on forward this year and, and getting to know him a little bit, he's a talented, talented player, man. Like, this kid's puck skills are pretty elite. You know, he's got a high-level shot. I think a big thing for Pat is he's so heavy on the puck. Um, his stick down low is so good, and I think Jordan just hit the nail on the head. He, he can be so calm with the puck that sometimes it's like he takes too long to make a play. Like, it's almost like he needs to make everything perfect. Um, but, you know, I like it full marks to him to go back and play play D in his 20 year old year and to play as good as he did like, I think he played 30 minutes yeah um, yeah the one night it, it's just crazy and I, I still I do remember I remember that was when Steiner went down and Cedar got suspended um and we almost used Pap earlier in the year on D and he was he was so excited yeah we had but, him on when we had him on Attack Rap, he, he mentioned that he played six games last year with Guelph. And I, I said, you're a Swiss Army Mice. So you basically played every forward position. He goes, oh, I can play D2. So when I saw him back there on the lineup, it, I was just like, oh, he's ready for it. And he's eager to go. So that just shows you what type of person he is, too. And when you guys acquired him, you guys not only got a quality player, but you got a quality person. And, yeah. and he really is He really is a Swiss Army knife. Like, going back to what Mark said, like, just kind of highlight there was uh, the Peterborough Ottawa wins. Like, Pap was our fourth line center at that point, yeah. and he With allowed us to play four. Yeah, and he allowed because of the way Pat played, he allowed us to play four lines in that tough weekend, and that allowed us to get those four points. Yeah, so, like he basically single handedly helped those guys along, and they kind of just jumped on his back, and that's that was a huge weekend, and that was an awesome job by Pat for that weekend for sure. We're into the final 10 minutes of this week's edition of Attack Rap. Adrian, let's talk about the returnees. I'll, I'll kick it over to you. Where do you want to start? Where do you want to ask the guys? Well, I, I'm going to start right now with, with the 03 group. You guys have five 03s, Teddy Sawyer, Sam Sadley, Caleb Lawrence, uh, Denny Gua, and Ethan Burroughs. Only three can be on the roster at a certain point, past a certain point next season. Um, it's going to be a tough call. They're all worthy candidates. So what goes into the process of these, uh, of selecting which ones make it? I don't, I don't want you guys to go off the rails here and tell us who you're, who you guys are going to make. We wouldn't tell you, don't worry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, just what goes through your guys' mind? What's the process like? Yeah, it's let the debate begin, essentially. We've already had many debates about it. Um, obviously, Things could happen over the summertime, for sure, if a deal comes across our table. Um, but for the most part, and, you know, let's see how they their summer progresses. We, you know, we'll see them at the barbecue. We'll see guys how their workouts are going as we talk through the summer. We'll, you know, we'll see how our team's shaping up um, if we do make some off-season acquisitions. So it it almost might, you know, this decision might be made for us depending on what we need um as we head into next year with you know size of caleb lawrence or obviously puck moving ability of sam Sedley or teddy sawyer or, you know how, how rugged he is in front how hard he plays ethan burrow there's so many things obviously each guy brings you're just trying to find the right piece that fits your team the best for what it needs i think for us too uh, and a big thing like just touch on what Jersey there too like our end goal is going to championship period. You know, we're we're going to get three guys that are going to do whatever it takes for us to win. And that kind of hits the nail on the head of what Jordan said. Like, we'll see what they're like at the barbecue, William. Take monitor their workouts, see what they look like. Um, you know, are they putting weight on? Are they skating lots? Um, I think those things all go into that, and that's so important for us. Now, when you look back at their seasons as a whole, you guys mentioned early on the show that you might have been a little disappointed in in the older players in your in your core. Does that resonate with that O three group? Um, I mean, I don't know. Teeks, you take this one. I mean, most of them are forwards, anyways. I guess. Yeah. Really I bad. think uh, <laughs> you look at the start of the year, like you know, Denny Gore was on a probably a hundred point place at the start of the year. You know, and. and for us, for the second year in a row, it's down the stretch. It kind of dwindled for him, you know, and that's, like I said before, we're looking to win a championship. 
Um, and that's, you know, we need, we need guys that are going to be consistent throughout the year. And I think Ethan Burroughs just is a Swiss army knife. Another guy's a Swiss army knife, man. Like he does everything for us. Like we get shorthanded. Like he steps over the boards before Wally even says anything. Like, you know, power plays, like he's just the guy there. Six on five. He's our, he's one of our first forwards. Five on six. He's one of our first forwards. Like, you know, the guys call him daddy bird just because he's so responsible. You know, he's legit the dad of the team. And you look at Caleb Lawrence, like, big huge body when he's on he's dominant um when he's on like he he screams nhl potential um i think for him just handling those injuries and handling the inconsistencies and, and losing two years has been tough on him um you know i think he needs to put a little bit more into his body um but i think if he does do that like there's there's a high high ceiling there <clears throat> you know jordan could talk about sam sadly like this guy's just different man he's just special he's just so smart uh, people don't understand how smart this kid is no. and it's I don't even need to coach him anymore like that's he's coaching the young guys he's coaching Raji he's he's he thinks like an like a pro um and it's nice to have obviously took a little bit of time to get him there but when you talk to a guy that thinks hockey and, and knows like talks hockey it, it's it's Sam Sedley he just eats it up he understand reads you know away from the puck there might not be a better player in the league that can see the game the way he does he definitely needs to improve on his skating he needs to improve on his shot he needs to improve on his strength but those to me are all things that you can physically improve on um what he has a lot it can't be taught and that's really my sales pitch to nhl teams that ask about him you know give this kid a chance he he will sneak up on you at 25 and they'll be like where did this kid come from because you know if he just keeps the the development window that he's been that he's been making and hitting, I think there's big things for him, obviously, going forward. We've only got a couple of minutes left here, guys. So I we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about Colby Barlow. I know we touched on him a little bit here, but I'm sure you guys are pretty pumped up to see where he goes and how high he goes in the NHL entry draft uh, come this summer. But talk about how special this season was and, and just getting that front row ticket to watch him uh, day in and day out work on his craft. I'm going to say something for five seconds and then I'm turning it over to Teeks because this is like his little brother. So Teeks is taking care of this kid. He works them every single day. His shot's incredible. The, the kid's amazing as a person. I, I could not be more excited for his future and just for his successes because he deserves every ounce of it. Yeah, like, you know, I think George hit the nail on the head. Like, guys always ask, like, what, like, what's he going to be? I'm like, guys, like, he's a hockey player, man. Like, yeah. At the worst, he's going to be a third line checker because he's going to figure it out. You know, he's got the potential to score 20 for 10 years in the NHL. He's got potential to score 35 in the NHL. Like, depending on the type of summer that he has, this kid might play in the NHL next year. Like, who knows? Like, he's that good. Um, he's that much of a difference maker. You know, like, everyone's seen it, man. Like, all he needs is a half a second to get a shot off, and there's a good chance it's going to go on the back of the net. Like, there's times he comes off the ice and be like, hey, like, was that close? Like, Kobe, like, I didn't even see the puck leave your stick. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> right? So, but, like, just the way, like, again, like what Jordan said, like, just the work he puts in every day. Like, he gets mad when you get him off the ice. Like, in between playoffs, like, I was like, dude, you got to get off. Like, we got a game tomorrow. And he was, like, getting mad. He'd be like, no, I want to stay out. I'm like, no, Wally's going to try to kill us. Get off. The ice. <laughs> well, that, I mean, guys. Top 10? Oh, 100%. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that because we, we got to wrap things up. We only got 15 seconds here, but I just quickly want to say, Jordan and Sean, thanks so much for taking some time out. Enjoy the summer. You know, as much as it was a disappointing end of the season, a lot of optimism for what could be next year. So thanks so much, guys. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. When it comes to drugs, how much freedom is too much for kids? Drugs are out there. Will my teen feel free to say no around other kids? I didn't live drug-free when I was younger. Can I admit that to my kids? Drugs worry me, but how can I feel free to talk about it with my kids? Questions about drugs and kids? Call or chat to get real-time support.
Calling all journalism students. Omni Television is once again awarding scholarships to qualified students pursuing a career in third language journalism. When I got this scholarship,